Hello propeller heads and welcome back to part two of the visit to the Fleet Aeron Museum at Royal Naval Air Station Yeovilton in Somerset, England. In this video we're going to be looking at the restoration workshop as well as concentrating on Hall 2 of the museum which features amongst other things the Battle of the Atlantic display, the Second World War display and the Korean War display. To start things off, we're going to get the museum's curator of aircraft to show us around this little thing here. And it's not what you might think it is. Okay, this is Dave Morris, curator of aircraft here at the Fleet Aero Museum. He's going to take us through some of the details about aircraft. Like, uh, when I saw this, I thought, oh, this is probably an Hellcat. But of course, that's not what we called it, was it? Uh, the Wildcat. The Wildcat. Wild ah. Hellcat's there. Hellcat's over there. Right. Wildcat's we'll over here, later. but that's not even a Wildcat. That's, that's, that's a Martin. That's, that's, that's right. This is the earlier. Oh, oh right. Question. Okay. So, what do I know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you're going to tell us about the restoration work on this one? Yeah, this, this is the uh, follow-on project from the Corsair, and if, if, if you look at the two aircraft together, it's one of the reasons why we've got them in, in the World War II hall now. They are the end result of probably about five years worth each of restoration time. Restoration in the sense of picking and peeling and scraping and rubbing all of the paint from the 1960s carefully away and it re-exposing the totally original paint from the 1940s. Now that's where I'm like, trying to take the collection where possible now. Repainting, refinishing, uh, refurbishing, fine, there's room for that. I'm not always sure people always carry out a restoration in, in perhaps a way that we would, we would yeah. now like to, to achieve it here. So these are two good examples of, of real high quality museum restoration work alongside the repaints and the rebuilds and the restrains. So if we look at some of the detail on here, we have, and the, the, this one is a bit of a 50-50 case, unfortunately the, the fuselage section, or most of the fuselage section, was stripped in the 1960s, completely back to bare metal. Um, but uh, we, we've colour matched very, very accurately, we've had the laboratory matching uh, done on the paint, and even that paint is now on top of a removable film, so that if we ever needed to get back to the original fuselage, it would be a lot, lot, lot easier to do. However, all of the rest of the aircraft, the wings, the tailplane, the rudder, the pin, some of the small engine cowl parts are completely original from 1940, and this is totally unique now, it's the only one of the batch of 81 G36As ordered by France didn't make it to France during 1940 the fall of France came to Great Britain for the fleet air arm and we're still ongoing doing the research now trying to decipher why the strange colour scheme yeah, because I've never seen this colour scheme uh, absolutely it, it, um, you know quite what the origin of the paint colouring itself is that is still very much something that we're deep into research now there will be a book ultimately to follow like the Corsair project but we are still neck deep into research just trying to get every last piece in place before we go to print and say this is what we believe the truth to be it's got to get the facts right absolutely it's, it's the one off chance we've got the only one left on the planet it's down to us to get it right we don't want to race that, we don't just want to guess, uh, we just want to improve on everything which has been written or thought about these airplanes in the past yep. uh, and uh, make sure we get the story just that little bit tighter using everybody's information. It would be very easy to say people have got it wrong in the past. No, they haven't. They've just worked on the best information that they have, of course, and we're very keen to point that out. We're not into saying you've got it wrong, we're getting it right. We're just saying it's up to us to use the best information possible and we have the last exactly. whole object to do it with. Get the best position to get the facts uh, uh, the 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 along with everybody else's cool. previous information. So we're, on the shoulders of giants. we're just rolling the ball a bit further. Simple as that. Okay. If you look at the Corsair, Let's take a look at the Corsair. The Corsair was the test case example. This this is the one we did back in 2000, and, well, 2000 2001. It took to 2005 to finish it. In between our other museum work. We don't do the paint archaeology, the paint rubbing, the paint scraping all day long every day. A, it would drive you mad. B, you wouldn't get the quality of result. We can drop in on it, we can, we, can, we can switch it on and switch it off in between our other museum work. That also gives us research time 
on the things that we find, so that, that's very important as well. So in a, s a series of sections, year by year, we did the entire aircraft, starting in 2000 as a Millennium Project, and this was the test case to prove what we hoped and thought we could achieve, is that micro peeling of paint away from aircraft that have been painted in the 60s or the 70s maybe, uh, and rethink that and in a sense unrestore bad restoration work that was done at the time. Not always possible, but with the, with the Corsair and the Martlet, we have actually succeeded with two very, very worthy projects there. Yeah, Some of the, yeah I mean, everything you see, we haven't mimicked anything, we haven't um, distressed it or made it look old. Everything you see is just what we've uncovered from beneath that 1960s paint layer. Thankfully, a whole airplane's worth of history was, was still in place on the course there. Hi guys, okay, one of the more interesting things that you don't see uh, a lot of people talk about the course there is this little piece of wood here. And this was strapped on by the British. Because of the massively powerful engines and the low landing speed on the carrier, the torque alone would sometimes cause these planes to split and spin in the air, crashing and killing the pilot and anybody on the, on the decks. By adding this piece of wood here, this actually caused the plane to balance out and cause the actual wings to keep level rather than tilting to one side with the torque. A simple piece of wood stuck on by the Brits, stop their Corsairs crashing. What have we got here then? Ah, uh, Yokosuka Oka 2. This has been in our um, Pacific War um, exhibition for, for 20 plus years now. And again, Following the theme of the Martlet and the Corsair, I've always wondered what there is to investigate the original markings on this. It belongs to the Science Museum. Um, so although it's down from exhibition now for a number of reasons and, and into the, the safety of our uh, conservation hangar, I've got to obviously make all the direct approaches now to the Science Museum, explain where it is now that it's not on display, and um, get a request to time carrying out a full investigation, possibly as in deep as the Corsair Marley, whether they will let us explore the paint fully, um, whether they'll just allow us to examine it by partial dismantling, I don't know. All, the, all those, those um, correct procedures we will now go through, but uh, hopefully in about 18 months time that should set us uh, in a position to, to investigate one of what I believe is probably only 11 or 12 of these opus left in existence. So, so it's a very, very important airplane very fascinating history and I'm sure there's a lot of details now um, with our knowledge of how to, to, to carry out the paint archaeology um, hopefully we'll be able to add a lot of information to the, to the OCA database. I have seen a couple of these, not in person, but I know there's one for example at the US Air Force Museum in uh, Dayton, Ohio, but they're all very much painted up and polished for display, you know, they're not really in the original uh, format if you like. Most and many of them, yeah, most and many of them have been repainted over the years and similarly this one. Um, I've seen two at the Smithsonian, one of which is a 1950s paint scheme on top of what I believe is the completely original orange training scheme, uh, the two-seat trainer version. Um, so there, there are one or two out there that, which still have, I believe, some very, very rare and original paintwork to, to, to be investigated. Um, so we'll see in the fullness of time whether we're allowed to, to, to follow suit with that. So that's another potential deep restoration project yep. that we have on the go. Uh, in the background you can see the um, rebuild. We've got, we've got a rebuild now rather than, rather than a restoration. We're actually trying to define what we, what we call each of our projects. Yep. Um, and the Gladiator is now very much a rebuild using as many components as we have uh, original. So the engine. Well, we've got an engine, but that's from a Bolling Brook. That's actually not a. Oh. Uh, that's not a Gladiator engine. It's the, oh, it's the closest we can get okay. to um, a Gladiator engine. Um, the fuselage is a piece of fuselage which came up from the bottom of Lake Ledgerskog uh, in Norway back in the 1970s. It's been in storage until recently. Wow. That is now straightened out uh, with some new sections in, but there's probably a bank. 60% original tube work reclaimed from the bottom of the lake back in that rebuild. Uh, a lot of the tail fin is uh, reclaimed original. The undercarriage leg struts uh, are original. So you, but you everything else we've made in-house. The bulkhead, the fuel tank, the rudder, 
everything else. We've run out of new parts. We're now, we're now manufacturing and rebuilding. From so as, as much as possible, it's original Gloucester Gladiator, or as close as you can get it. Yes. So yeah. Everything we're now man making to manufacture is um, working from, from Gloucester drawings or reverse engineering from yeah. uh, either the Shuttleworth or the Retro Track yeah. or the uh, Duxford Gladiator, wherever we can, we can, we can get access to copies and you know, parts accurately, that, that's what we're doing. If you look at a lot of the detail on the Gladiator close, you'll see it has got pitting marks. It is, you know, it is clearly the, the, the original hardware which has been to the bottom of the lake in Leisure Scog. Um, the aircraft were operating on the ice as a nice ice runway in 1940, um, along with 263 Squadron RAF. There was only one Royal Naval aircraft operating with, with the RAF squadron there, seconded over, and that was N5518. We believe that that went down on the ice along with um, all of those aircraft that, which had to be abandoned there. So, of course, in the spring of 1940, um, some of them were just, had been strafed, some of them were just abandoned. Uh, they all collapsed with the ice and went to the bottom of the lake. Again, some of the, the, the original detail we've been lucky to find is, is, is this strut in here with a bullet hole. Um, clear evidence of the strafing attack on those aircraft on the ice in 1940. Obviously any details and information like that that we've come across, we're very, very keen to, to keep and, and reabsorb into the, to the project. This fuselage was um, jigged together by RetroTrack in Gloucester. The, the, um, RetroTrack and, and Air, the company that are building a, a, a Gladiator to fly. Peter Watts is very generous with his, with his time and his, his equipment. And he's, he basically set this um, fuselage in the jig for us to start the project rolling. So we're, we're, we're um, very appreciative of, of RetroTrack's efforts to, to start our Gladiator project off. Um, Peter was, was key in finding a lot of these components rematching them back together and actually getting us a, a fuselage to work from. The bulkhead, as we've said, is, is completely new. That's following all of the Gloucester drawings. That's, although it's not made out of flight material, it's made as close to flight and original factory standard as possible, as is the fuel tank and, again, the rudder and anything else which we're making now to fit on the aircraft. And then it was out of the restoration workshop and back up to Hall 2 to have a look at some of the classic aircraft on display here, starting with this one. This is a Fairy Fulmar. The Fairy Fulmar on display here at the museum is Fairy Fulmar November 1854, which was the first production version and the first true prototype of the Fulmar, which made its initial flight in January 1940. It was the first one to fly before going to Boscombe Down for flight trials, and it also took part in deck landing trials on board HMS Illustrious in 1940. 600 of these aircraft were built for the Royal Navy, and this one is the last one surviving. The Fulmar was, a, it was unusual because it was a two-seat carrier-borne fighter. It was armed with eight 30 caliber machine guns. The Navy had specified that they wanted a two-man crew for this thing because it was felt that a navigator was going to be required to cope with navigating over long distances over the ocean. As a fighter aircraft, it wasn't without issues. Because the Navy had specified it had to have two crew, uh, the Navy felt that an aircraft, a carrier-borne fighter aircraft, was going to need a navigator to cope with the difficulty of navigating across large oceans. And so that meant the thing ended up being bigger, heavier and underpowered than its land-based fighter counterparts. And yet despite that, it didn't do too badly. They first started operating in defence of the Malta convoys in September 1940, operating from HMS Illustrious, and by the end of October 1940, they had shot down 10 Italian bombers. Fulmars also flew fighter cover for all the fairy swordfish torpedo bombers, which very, very successfully wrecked the Italian fleet at the raid on Taranto. During the Taranto raid, they claimed six Italian fighter aircraft. They also had a very, very long range. With a 60-gallon drop tank, these things could fly for 1,100 miles, which made them very useful as scouts and reconnaissance aircraft, and they were used successfully for this purpose in the attack on the Bismarck. By 1942, however, this thing was getting a bit long in the tooth, and it ended up being phased out of Royal Naval Service and replaced by aircraft like the Grumman Martlet or the Supermarine Seafire. Unlike the Fulmar, Fairy did produce another aircraft that saw service long past its sell-by date, and you can see it up there. 
the fairy swordfish torpedo bomber, referred to uh, not with great affection by its crew by the nickname the string bag. The swordfish, famous of course for the attack on the Bismarck, and also for the attack on the Italian fleet anchorage at Taranto, where torpedoes dropped by swordfishes accounted for three Italian battleships and one cruiser sunk or disabled. A much less successful swordfish operation was the Channel Dash in February 1942, when the German battleships Scharnhorst and Gneisenau, in company with the heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen, made a race from Brest and Brittany to their home ports in Germany. Thanks to the shocking incompetence of the Royal Air Force and Royal Naval Coastal Command that day, six swordfish flew practically alone against the German force, which was heavily covered by the Luftwaffe. None made it back to base, which led the German Admiral in command to remark a mothball attack of a handful of ancient planes piloted by men whose bravery surpasses any other action by either side that day. On a slightly more cheerful note, there's this display here, uh, which is of a glove, which you'll see in a moment, thrown from a swordfish from the MV Rapana onto the deck of the MV Empire Macalpine. Both ships operating in the same convoy. In reply to a signal from the Macalpine, sarcastically referring to a slight flight deck crash on the Empire Macalpine the previous day. The swordfish pilot, the day after the crash, threw this onto the deck of the Empire Macalpine in response. I think that is fantastic. <laughs> Who thinks they know what this is? I'll give you a clue. It was used by the Germans. I'll give you another clue. It was used by U-boats. Up there at the top, you can see where the rotor blades would have been attached. This was actually a I suppose technically you could call it a gyrocopter. It was completely unpowered. They were stowed in two watertight compartments aft of the conning tower on U-boats. And the idea was they would be tethered to the U-boat by a 150 metre long cable. And then as the U-boat motored along the surface, the wind would cause the rotor blades to rotate and it would climb into the air. These things would give a U-boat an effective spotting range of 25 nautical miles, which was 20 nautical miles better than the view you would get from the top of the conning tower. Despite the obvious advantages, it took 20 minutes to recover one of these things, and with the threat of uh, Allied air power, you didn't have 20 minutes to crash dive when you spotted a maritime patrol aircraft incoming. So these things were only really used in the far south Atlantic and in the Indian Ocean, and they were only used successfully once when U-177 used one to successfully spot, intercept and sink a Greek steamer in 1943. This little beauty is Evil Intentions, and I think the name of this aircraft is just fantastic. It's the Fairy Firefly. This replaced the Fairy Fulmar in service with the Royal Navy as a carrier-borne fighter and reconnaissance aircraft. It was introduced in service in 1943. It was retired from Royal Naval Service in 1956, but the Naval Air Services of Australia, Canada, India and the Netherlands were still using them as late as 1962, when the Netherlands used them to conduct a couple of attack sorties in Dutch New Guinea. Like its predecessor, the Fulmar, it was a two-seater. Again, the Navy insisted on having a navigator and it was 4,000 pounds heavier than the Fairy Fulmar. And yet, thanks to a much more powerful Rolls-Royce Griffin engine and much, much better streamlining and aerodynamics, this thing could go 40 kilometers per hour faster than the Fulmar. Most of that weight came from the four 20 millimeter Hispano cannons, two in each wing. 1,702 Fireflies were built. They flew fighter cover for the bombers that attacked the Tirpitz in 1944, and Fairy Fireflies were the first British-designed, built and operated aircraft to fly over Tokyo in the Second World War. Obviously the American B-25s and B-29s got there ahead of us. 24 of the 1,702 Fireflies that were built still exist, although only three of them are in flying condition. The Royal Canadian Navy Firefly AS-5 is on display and in flying condition at the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum in Canada. At Naval Air Station Nowra in New South Wales, Australia, the Royal Australian Navy Historic Flight operates one. 
and there's another former Royal Australian Navy machine now in the USA. Here at Yeovilton, the Fleet Arrow Museum actually has two fireflies. Sadly, neither of them are in flying condition. Supermarine Seafire, the uh, carrier-borne, Royal Naval version of the world-famous Spitfire. Great aircraft. Not a fantastic carrier-borne aircraft. Well, it was and it wasn't. Uh, once it was in the air, fantastic. You know, it was a Spitfire. Getting the thing back down on the deck of the carrier, slightly tricky. And look at how close together the landing gear is. Uh, if you were to look next door, an American carrier board torpedo bomber, you see how far apart the legs are and that splayed at an angle as well. Coming back to the Spitfire, or the Seafire, if it's correct, hey? often you'd see footage of a Spitfire coming in for a landing and it would tend to wobble all over the place, trying to get those wheels down on the ground. Very tricky if you're trying to do that on a carrier. Nevertheless, it was a good aircraft, just very tricky to land. As a carrier-based fighter. The Navy tried to get their sweaty hands on Spitfires for carrier service as early as February 1940 and uh, Churchill himself had to put a stop to it as the Spitfires were badly needed by the Royal Air Force. In the meantime the Navy made do with uh, Grumman Martlets to replace their ferry full miles and the Seafires eventually started entering service in 1942. 48 Spitfire Mark 5Bs had an arrestor hook added and became the first Seafires. What we have here is the Hawker Sea Fury. This is one of the fastest production prop aircraft ever built. It was developed during the Second World War but entered service with the Royal Navy too late to see service two years after the war ended. This is the Royal Navy's premier carrier-based prop fighter aircraft of the post-war years. It was originally designed as a... Well, it's sort of the culmination of the process of the Tempest and the Typhoon development. It was originally known as the Tempest Light Fighter. The reason it was so fast, it had a choice of three different engines when they were trying to decide what they were going to use to build this thing. They were going to use the awesomely powerful Napier Saviour engine, Rolls Royce Griffin. They eventually went with this thing over here, Bristol Centaurus. And that is the Bristol Centaurus engine. It was an 18-cylinder, two-row radial piston engine, and it was the power plant of the Hawker Sea Fury. The engine was developed as early as 1939, but by the time the Sea Fury was developed, this thing was pushing out more than 3,000 horsepower, and it turned this thing into one of the most powerful piston engine fighters ever built. Now, of course, the Hawker Sea Fury was a piston aircraft operating at a time, certainly from the early 1950s all through to the late 1950s when it retired service with the Fleet Aero, at a time when most of the aircraft it was going up against were powered by jet engines. And this, of course, uh, was also true when these things saw service in the Korean War. In fact, there was one such occasion when a flight of four Sea Furies led by Commander Peter Carmichael, known by his nickname Hoagie Carmichael, was flying a flight of four Sea Furies when they got bounced by eight of these things, the MiG-15. The MiG-15, as you can see here, is armed with 37mm and a 23mm cannon. And one of the peculiarities of that cannon arrangement were that at the extremes of range, what would happen, as indeed happened to Commander Carl Michael's flight, was one of the aircraft, uh, reported seeing the, the shots due to the different ballistic natures of the 23 and 37 millimeter cannon shells. So the 37 millimeter shell passed below his aircraft, the tracer from the 27 millimeter shell passed above his aircraft because the MiGs were firing before they were at optimum firing range. During that engagement, Commander Carmichael shot down one MiG-15 and they damaged two others. Bear in mind, prop driven aircraft outnumbered two to one by Korean MiGs. This thing was the one that walked away the victor. All right, propeller heads, we're two videos in and we've barely seen half of what's available on display at this absolutely fantastic museum. Coming in future videos, we have Hall 3, the carrier flight deck experience, Hall 4, prototype and experimental aircraft, 
the Cobham Restoration Hall, where you can see them doing restoration work here on what will be the world's only surviving Barracuda torpedo bomber. All coming up in future videos. As always, folks, take care out there, and I'll catch you next time.